will, turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 20. And you, you'll be able to follow us in your outline. We are presently working... At verse 32, Acts 20, verse 32. Going to open in a word of prayer and commence with our study. Let's pray. So, Father, we thank you for this time. Again, your mercy is at the end of another week, and we are here only by your grace. And we ask that we might be here, or at least Quorum Day, in your presence, uh, genuinely and authentically, and in a posture that is able to hear from you. So, grace us at this time to give you undivided attention and speak to us, Lord, through your word. Help us to understand your will and your purpose for the life of the church and then for the life of every believer who has the privilege of setting their eyes on your scriptures and to hear your voice through your word. You know the challenges that we all have individually uh, and even us collectively. And so we ask that you would help us in our time of trouble, help us in our time of challenge, Whatever area we are in, we are so thankful and privileged to have access to you through your son and by your spirit. We love your word. We love your truth. We love your ways, O God. And we ask that you would grant us grace to continue uh, being conformed to the image of your darling son, who is uh, altogether perfect and splendid and lovely to us as well. Um, Open our ears that we might understand your word. Open our eyes that we might behold wonderful things out of your law. For those that are yet coming, give them traveling mercies. For those that are watching and those that are listening, we ask that you would aid them as well. Um, If you don't open our heart, if you don't open our mind, if you don't bring clarity to our soul, we won't be able to profit from your word. We need you at this time. We need your spirit. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to read in Acts chapter 30, verse 32 um, through 34. I think we'll be able to get there. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll be able to work it through. And now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all them which are sanctified. I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. Yea, ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessity and to them that were with me. I have showed you all things how that by soul laboring you ought to support the weak And to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had spoken thus, he kneeled down and prayed with them all. And they wept sore and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spake, that they should see his face no more. And they accompanied him to the ship. If you have your outline, your present bulletin or program, you'll see it that we're dealing with point number two, and now, and now. Last week we dealt with and acknowledged the conjunction or the clause of therefore that was given to us in verse 31. And then we started working through the therefore clause, and now we are at what I would consider and now. There are fundamentally three things that Paul does after he has given a prognosis of what the church at Ephesus would, Ephesus would endure when he left. We call it a prognosis because he plainly told them of the wars and the battles and the storms that they would engage. We call it a prognosis because he was letting them know that they would endure some hardship in terms of assaults against the church, both from the outside and from the inside that a storm would rise up and a battle would be engaged and a war would be fought. And I would remind you that he's talking to the church at Ephesus. So if you know your Bibles and you understand the historical unfolding of the church at Ephesus, Ephesus is a, a, a marvel of God's grace in the midst of a really, really a wicked culture. The Roman Empire in Ephesus, as I told you, was a city not the church, but the city that was what was called a sponsor city for Rome. That means that Ephesus bore within its populace a lot of idolatry, a lot of evil, a lot of wickedness. Temples to different pagan gods were there. Uh, The worship of idols was 
Uh, it was heavy there. It was strong in this sense that as you read the gospel coming into Ephesus drew many women, men, men and women to a bonfire where they had to bring all their books, all their religious artifacts to the middle of the street and burn them up because they had engaged in such idolatrous zeal for demonism and witchcraft and all of that indicated that Ephesus was a stronghold for a bastion of demonic influence which was sponsored by the Roman Empire. All that to say, a gospel church in a dark era like that reminds us what our Lord said in Matthew chapter 5, I have placed you as a city on top of a hill, as a light unto the world. In this dark place where men and women don't know their way, the church of the living God is to be a light, a lamp, a way out of darkness into the presence of God by the corporate expression of worship and proclamation. And certainly the church at Ephesus was that. I also told you, whenever God places a local church in a community, particularly a community that had already been devoted to darkness, that that community was not going to sit passively and allow the church to exist without attacking it. And this is true around the world to this very hour. You won't really find a place where there's a community of believers in the midst of a society that is openly hostile to the gospel and that society, if it's the majority, not attacking the church. So the church is commonly under persecution anywhere you go in the world. That's a common parlance. What's unique for us today in America is that America, the American church does not really know that kind of persecution. We are fairly free of persecution. Our only trials are secularism, carnality, personal narcissism, et cetera. You guys know that. And when we talk about persecution or we talk about suffering, it might be on an isolated level where you might uh, be on a job and because you are a minority on the job, you suffer at the hands of those who have the ability to uh, distort the facts, they can criticize you, slander you, etc. But in terms of the church on a larger public level, our society is not yet attacking the church like that, not as an aggregate whole. Louis, can you do me a favor and turn it uh, on AC? Put it on 69 AC, please, because it's going to be warm in a moment. But the church historically has always been sort of a pariah in society. And the thing we want to appreciate about what Paul is doing in Acts 20 is that he knows he won't see them ever again. So what would he do if he were a faithful shepherd or a loving brother in Christ? Would he lie to them and tell them everything is going to be all right? You're going to have a wonderful, prosperous life as a gospel church in this city and kind of leave them with a false hope that really does not correspond with the reality of what Paul knew was already brewing and stirring in terms of the hostilities that he had met with while he was there? Would he be more faithful to let them know, hey, you are in for a fight, and you're going to have to do the things that are necessary to shore up yourself against that fight if you're going to survive? The latter would be really the more faithful thing to do, right? Let them know you're about to enter into a fight. Right. You're raising your kids and you know you live in a, a society that's aggressive, assertive, and in many ways dog eat dog. And your kids are now going to go to public schools or they're going to engage in the community. What are you going to do? Tell your kids that they are in Pollyanna, they're in Disneyland, they're in a society where they don't have to worry about people um, uh, criticizing them, discriminating against them, or hurting them, or taking advantage of them when in fact you know that will happen among kids. If you really love them, would you not teach them how to be circumspect, discerning, critical thinkers, and even defensive livers, living in society on a defensive level? If you love them, you teach them that, right? You teach them how to detect when an individual does not have the best motive uh, in their mind and heart relative to that child. You might even teach the children how to avoid trouble or to defend themselves physically if necessary. 
so that your children do not come home and be so overwhelmed by the, sh the shock of a culture that will gobble you up and destroy you if it can. And, uh, and then they would have to put the blame at our feet, right? If you care about your children, you will let them know you got a battle to fight every day you're in school. I remember, don't you, my first day in preschool. Do you remember that? I remember that first day in preschool. I remember a lot of things. Some of us can remember things all the way back to two years old. That's how I was. I can remember stuff back to two years old. And I certainly remember my first day in preschool. It was bizarre. Um, there was nothing destructive about it per se, but it was bizarre. But day two, day three became a problem. And from that day on, I remember my early years of school being a time of conflict. My mom would drop me off and I would be in a school with a whole bunch of strangers largely. This is the experience of what we call the little people, okay? And we all were little people at one time. And this is the thing that grown-ups have to remember that your kids are little people. They're not like dogs and cats, they're little people. And so for them, they are processing life, aren't they? And they're wondering whether or not they have what is adequately necessary to get through the day. And sometimes school is a daunting task, isn't it? A daunting task. It can break you or it can make you. And this is why children often have a lot of problems. Well, I'm saying that to actually get at your psychological and emotional uh, uh, apparatus around why Paul was so urgent about the church at Ephesus understanding what they are about to go through. So there are two texts that would help facilitate and augment our understanding of Paul's warning in verse 29 and 30, and that is the book of Ephesians itself, which we're going to tap into as we deal with verse 30. And of course, the ultimate book is the book of Revelation, chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. If you turn there for a moment, I'm going to show you the effects of what Paul was warning about what would occur to the church at Ephesus if they didn't persevere to watch. Now, the church at Ephesus was one of seven churches in Asia Minor, as you know, that the Lord Jesus loved. And in his own gratuitous and sovereign prerogative, he wrote to them through John the Apostle, somewhere around the end of the first century, a letter to seven churches, which seven letters to the seven churches benefit us all. But can you imagine the Lord of that, the local church that you're part of writing you a letter, that local church? It meant that he was real, that he was risen, that he was reigning, and that he was aware of your issues. And now you get a chance to hear from the Lord on a pertinent, poignant level about his assessment of where you are after about 60 years, 8033 to 8090, almost 100 year, uh, 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 a century after the first century, some 60 or 70 years. So just imagine what you were like in the days of the Apostle Paul as a young church, 8035, 40, actually this would be about 8050. And then where you are 45 years later, after the words that Paul gave in Acts chapter 20, verse 28, 29, and 30. Now listen to the Lord's words in verses 1 through 7. We'll make an assessment and we'll go back and see how Paul resolved to let his children go to deal with life under the hand of God. Unto the angel of the church at Ephesus write these things, saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know your works, and I know your labor, and I know your patience, and how you cannot bear them which are evil, and how you have tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and you have found them what? And how you have borne, that is, how you have endured and you have been patient for my name's sake and how you have labored. I love the way Christ introduces himself to all seven churches. He introduces himself to all seven churches after giving them an identity marker of his own persona and attributes in accordance with that church's need. Then he explains to them, I've been with you all this time. I know you so accurately. Here is what I have assessed of you. That's really good to know. It's good to know that the Lord of the church knows the church. 
Even if some of the things he's going to talk about are going to be difficult, it is much better to have a present Lord who is aware of our difficulties than an absent Lord who doesn't know and much less care. So the Lord knows and he cares because he's always present, right? And so it says in verse four, nevertheless, I have somewhat what? Against you because you have what? Left your first love. So what I want you to understand is that what we're reading in Acts chapter 20 actually is what Paul was seeking to prevent in terms of the impact of the warfare and the conflict and the spiritual difficulty um, that the church at Ephesus was dealing with. Paul wanted to avoid some of this. They left their first what? All right, so uh, this is a problem. The Lord means for them to know this is a problem. In fact, he tells them, you, you got to repent because if you don't, I'm shutting the church down. That's what he says. So we know it's a problem, right? Here's what he says. So you can see verse five. Uh, yeah. Remember, therefore, from whence you are fallen, he calls it fallen. That's a problem, isn't it? And, re and repent and do the first works or else I will come unto you quickly and I will remove your candlestick out of its place except you what? Right. So it's a double emphasis of repentance that he's calling the church to. And he's warning her that if you don't, I'm going to take the light away. I'm going to take the gospel away. I'm going to take your impact in the culture away. The church can stay there. But if the candle is gone, the church is useless. And the candle is the gospel. The candle is the gospel. And we want to assess for a moment the difference between or the connection between Paul's warning in Acts 20 some A.D. 45, A.D. 50, and what Christ is saying in Revelation chapter 2, some 40 to 50 years later. The impact of the wars that Paul said they would engage in, the battles of false prophets on the outside and false prophets on the inside, and the constant relentless assaults of grievous wolves against the church at Ephesus describe for us an unending war, right? It's a war that they were engaged in. I actually want you who are part of grace to capture this word war. I want you to capture it. Because if you don't, you will fail to understand that that's what you're in every day. I want you to capture the word war right now because I want you to track with them uh, and, and sympathize with the consequences of relentless, unending war. I want you to track with them and I want you to sympathize with what happens when a body of believers are constantly at war? Or what happens when a couple who profess to be believers in Christ are constantly at war? Or what happens when a family is constantly in a wartime scenario where the husband and the wife are fighting? Or the, the, the parents are fighting with the kids? Or the kids are fighting with the parents? In any event, the war in the home the relentless, unending conflict in the household of professing believers ultimately will have its effect, won't it? As it would in the church as well. But one of the things I want you to grasp now is, is war is never spiritually productive. That's what I want you to get. You're going to learn this as we continue through the book of James in chapter 3. We're going there. James wants the church to mature. He wants it to grow. He wants it to prosper. But he knows that if the church continues down the path that it's going down because the church that James is ministering to, guess what? They're at war as well. And so a wartime scenario can produce in a human being certain characteristics necessary for survival but not necessary or conducive for productivity or fruitfulness. So I'm going to make the application to our world and our society in general so that you get the application personally. So when the master said in Matthew chapter 24 and Luke chapter uh, 17, 18 and 19, Mark 13, there shall be wars and rumors of wars. Uh, nations shall be against nation kingdom against kingdom. 
plowshares will be turned into swords and pruning hooks into spears and brothers shall be against brother and, and, and husband against uh, a wife and children against parents. He says these things will occur and at that time there will be famines and pestilences and death. And I've shared with you that what we are dealing with in the prophecy of Matthew, Mark, Luke really corresponds to the prophecy of Revelation 6 and the, the horsemen, the six horsemen, right? The four horsemen, rather, of the apocalypse, the sixth seal. Because wherever you have war, you have a destruction of the economy. And wherever you have the destruction of the economy, you have the destruction of the culture ecologically, agriculturally, and therefore you have an endangerment of the society at large. So where war occurs, there is a loss of stability, of peace, of economic thriving, and therefore people start to starve to death. And where they starve to death, they are in a famished state. So remember now, famines, according to the Lord's prophecy, are not just natural famines that occur because of anomalies in our uh, ecology. Famines are virtually always, always in the Bible a consequence of war. You guys got that? Right. And so the wars that you and I have seen in our own lifetime around the world wreaking havoc on societies around the world are always resulting in famine and sickness and death and a lack of stability, a lack of economic stability, a lack of social stability. Is that true? Right. And contextually, we want to be able to grasp these realities on a practical level because when we transfer them into the spiritual dimension, we get to ask the question, am I a warrior engaged in battle at such a level that I'm distracted from the high calling of being spiritually productive and a fruit-bearing citizen in, as a king, uh, in the kingdom of God? Am I always fighting, fighting, fighting so that I'm never, ever nurturing, nurturing, nurturing? Am I always engaged in defending myself so that I'm never engaged in building up? Am I always finding myself in conflict so that I'm never, ever in that place of nurturing? Those are really good questions, aren't they? And they are because the nature of warfare mitigates the nature of the kingdom of God because the kingdom of God is always about expansion, productivity, nurturing, cultivating, and bearing what? Fruit. But where there is war, that possibility is diminished significantly, if not altogether halted. Am I making some sense? And one of the symptoms that will come on early when you are constantly at war is you will lose the fundamental priority of your relationship with Christ. Did you get that? That's what he meant when he said, you guys have fought, you guys have overcome bad doctrine, you have exposed those who are heretics, false apostles, false Jews, you have borne the weight of conflict. So actually, Revelation chapter 2 is affirming what Paul said would occur, right? That they would be engaged in battle after battle after battle after battle, but there was a negative outcome. What was that negative outcome? They left their first love. So now all they have is what we call the warrior motif of Ephesians 6. Right? Put on the whole armor of God that you might stand against the wiles of the devil and having done so, stand. Having on, and then we go through the whole apparatus, right? And that's a wonderful set of exhortations in the context of fighting, but the church is not just a warrior because to simply be a warrior is to be engaged in simply standing your ground. The church is called to cultivation and seed sowing and, and, and producing fruit. But the only way that we can cultivate the seed sown and produce fruit is to be able to exist in a context of what? Peace. Am I making some sense? Peace. So in your own personal life, when you find yourself going through these um, extended trials, they wear you down. They wear you out. 
and they threaten your walk with Christ. Is that true? So you'll look up and you'll realize that you don't have the fuel for faith that is needed to live every day optimistically according to the gospel because faith is optimistic by nature, isn't it? Faith is the substance of things what? Hope for, the evidence of things what? Not seen. And so where my faith is diminished, my optimism is diminished, but where my faith and optimism is diminished, I can look and say it's probably because the love is diminished because faith works by what? Love. Now why is the love diminished? Because I've been so preoccupied with fighting that I haven't been able to cultivate the relationship with Christ that I need to in order to sustain the love that is essential for our reciprocating walk in union because without that union, I can't bear fruit. He told me I must abide in him and he must abide in me and his word must abide in me because without him, I can what? Nothing. 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 So when we look at Revelation chapter 2, verse 4, nevertheless, I have somewhat against you, I thought about this, and it's important for you to catch this, because sometimes we intentionally put holes in our theology around our positional benefits with Christ. We'll talk as if on a positional level, Christ really doesn't care about your life. Since now that you're the righteousness of God in Christ, you're sure to go to heaven, and that's true. But is our walk with Christ merely a positional thing, or is it a personal thing? And if it's personal, that means he cares about your condition, your attitude, your circumstances. And what I love about what our master said here, because this gives us insight into his shepherding role in your life and mine is, I got something against you. Whoa. Whoa. Well, I thought you loved me. I do. That's why I've got something against you. Right? And so interesting, the, the Greek verb there means to hold and to have and to possess. And for the Lord to use that term echo, it's a common Greek term. It means that something has passed through the relationship enough times for him to catch it. And isn't this exactly how relationships work? Things happen in relationships and we can let them go once and we can let them go twice. But when they trip us up a third or fourth time, we want to let it go, but we can't. We got to hold it now. We have to apprehend it because it's threatening the relationship. And that's what he's saying to the church of Ephesus. He's go, whoa, you guys are good at apologetics. You're good at deconstructing error and falsehood and false doctrine. And you can get at those guys and you can shoot your arrows and your spears and you can tear them down. You can destroy them. In fact, you have grown strong in your polemic against all of the heretics. I'll give you that. Isn't that what he said? But it was at the expense of your communion and fellowship with me. Isn't that amazing? So remember when you and I were working through verse 28 and 29, I tell you, as soon as I leave, Paul said, grievous wolves will come in, not sparing the flock and of your own selves will rise individuals speaking perverse things. If it were to draw away disciples unto themselves. And I gave you the picture of a flock of sheep, didn't I? And a just a, 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 a number of wolves. Let's 10, 20, 30, and they're coming in from all different directions and they are relentlessly attacking the flock. And I told you that word grievous really is the word burdensome because the flock couldn't rest because every time they turn around, here comes a grievous wolf coming in, attacking somebody. You can't rest when you're genetically born adversary because a wolf is a genetically born adversary to a sheep. Right. I mean, there is no room for fellowship between a wolf and a sheep until we enter into the millennium. The food chain won't have it. So no wolf, no sheep is ever comfortable around a wolf. And every time he turned around, here comes a wolf rushing in, attacking the sheep and off that sheep goes. So everybody in the flock was disturbed, weren't they? They were paralyzed. They were emotionally traumatized. And the only thing they could do to stand is go polemical, go uh, what we would call apologetic, 
fight against the doctrine, fight against the error, and that's all necessary. But it was at the expense of communion and prayer and fellowship where the fruit of the Spirit is nurtured in communion with the Savior in a context of peace. And so the church at Ephesus couldn't grow because you can't grow in that context. There's a difference between a thriving, growing church and a church that's just surviving. There's a difference between a believer who's just surviving and a believer who's thriving. There's a difference between a believing family that's just surviving and a believing family that's thriving because of the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ and the priorities of union and fellowship with him and the peaceful context in which that union and fellowship can allow nurturing. Am I making some sense? So when you meet a believer who has been able to, by the grace of God, extricate or deliver themselves from needless wars and to devote that time to their walk with Christ, that believer is going to bear more fruit of the Spirit and demonstrate those charitable characteristics that comes with fellowship with Christ and is going to be a benefit to other people. Did I make some sense right there? So now watch this again. So you might meet that believer that's always fighting battles and he or she is just in survival mode. We appreciate them. But if they're in survival mode because they're always in a wartime scenario and you bring them into your house and everybody's playing around and then the kids come running in the room and they pull out their sword because, you know, they got the post-traumatic stress disorder going on. Now you're uncomfortable because they don't have the sensitivity of what we call context. They're judging everything as if it's a sworn enemy when some of it is just a normality of life. And when you meet people that are out of kilter like that, you need to be able to observe that because that's not good for the family. Am I making some sense? And I'm speaking spiritually for the church as well. We often really like to meet and know and have in our camp warriors, but not if they're going to cut the kids' heads off, you know, because they're seeing ghosts and hearing voices, right? Um, and not if they're not appreciating the reality that God has granted us a peacetime scenario where we can go deep with Christ on a personal level of communion, roots down deep fruit bearing high you understand what i'm saying where they can take the armor off because they are in the context of the kingdom which is what righteousness peace and what righteousness peace and joy in the holy ghost and then just enjoy the presence of the living risen reigning lord and grow and be strengthened on the inside in other words like solomon said it in ecclesiastes chapter three there's a time for war and then there's a time for peace you guys hear what I'm saying? So I'm saying that Paul's words didn't fall on deaf ears and they came to pass to a certain extent. And Christ said, hey, 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 you guys, you guys have your creeds and confessions right. And you got your soteriology right. But your doctrine of sanctification is deficient right now on a practical level. And I can tell you that that's the case because you're not praying. Because if you were praying, I could hear you. So let's go back to our text and work through what Paul said he was needed, was needed in this context in order for them to avoid a complete destruction of that local church. In Acts chapter 20, moving from the therefore to the end now, from the therefore, and I told you that was a double prepositional conjunction to look back, remember what you learned from looking back, and then as you proceed forward, proceed forward with caution. It's the same thing as we would tell our kids when we let them out of the house and they're getting ready to cross the street. What do you do before you cross the street? You look both ways. Not just one, both ways. And that's what Paul was saying. Look both ways. Look backwards and look forward. Your forward walk must be circumspect. Your backwards walk must be totally reflective. Remember what I did for the space of almost three years. I warned you with tears. Remember that. Because once the battle is on, once you're trying to cross that street and those crazy drivers want to just kind of drive behind you, you got to be able to weather the storm, right? I warned you about that. 
And then he does something very profound, and I love this. This will move us into a more positive connotation of the exhortation today. And let's see if you can really track with this. I call this pastoral wisdom rooted in a love for the brethren um, and basically the only right thing that he could do. This is a pastoral uh, maturity on the part of Paul rooted in a love for the brethren and basically the only right thing that he could do. But as I state that, I want to make sure that you get that this only right thing that he is about to do is really something that is, for uh, a lack of a better word, word, commendable. Commendable. So we move from therefore to, and now, what's his next statement? I commend you. That's verse 32. And now, brethren, I commend you. Do you see that? And brethren, now, and now, brethren, I commend you. He says, I commend you first to God and then to the word of his grace. And then he explains, this is what we call an exegetical, what the word of his grace does. And I want to deal with all three parts tonight just to help you understand when Paul thought through all of the wars that Ephesus would have to fight and somehow he had a vivid, very vivid and clear vision of the assault of these pack of wolves coming into the church to destroy it. Remember, Ephesus is a hell hole sponsored by Rome, full of darkness, of which Christ said in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, it is the seat of Satan. It is the last dark kingdom of the four beasts of Daniel 7 that we must understand that if it has its way, it will kill every believer it can. All right, so I'm, again, I'm contextualizing this so that we can benefit from what he's saying. You got to let your children out into this jungle. So what are you going to do? Well, you're going to do the only right thing if you're a mature pastor and you love the people of God. You are going to commend them to God. You got that? You're going to commend them to God. Again, in the English, we don't really capture the real essence of that term, but I want to work with you on that. He says, and now, and now, and he's saying, I want you to pay attention to me. Right now, I am presently doing something for you. And you know what that is? I am taking the whole of you as a church, Ephesus, and I am presenting you to God. He says, given the prognosis, the only thing I can do is put you in God's hands. Do you guys get that? So that's what our word commend is. If it's in your outline, I want to just make sure you get this on a practical level. And I want you to have some takeaway here. Commend, not command, commend. The word literally means, the word commend literally means to put or place or set <coughs> before. To put, place, or set before. This is our little Greek preposition para for those of you who like Greek. And then its root verb is tithemi. And it's the word to stand or to place. So I'm going to give you sort of a corny analogy to help you get it. A mother, single, divorced, abandoned, whatever, has a child, but she can't take care of that child. She doesn't have the resources, the wherewithal to do it. The only right thing for her to do is to take that child and place that child before someone who can do a better job of taking care of that child than her. You guys got the analogy? Paratithomy means to take and set before. What Paul is saying is, I have taken you as a whole, a whole church, and I have set you before God. That's powerful. The way this word is used, I want to just make sure I illustrate it, is in Luke's gospel, chapter 9, verse 16. Luke's gospel, chapter 9, verse 16. I want you to see this. Remember, right now, what I am doing is sharing with you the behavior of a mature pastor who loves the brethren and is really only able to do one right thing given the circumstances that they are in. Are you there? 
So here is where the Lord Jesus has done ministry for several days now, and the people are hungry, and they have nothing to eat and nowhere to go. And here's what the text says in Luke chapter 9, verse 13. But he said unto them, Give ye them to eat. And they said, We have no more but five loaves and two fishes, except we should go and buy meat for all this people, which was something like 8,000 people, if not more. For they were about 5,000 men, plus women and children. And he said to the disciples, Make them sit down by 50s in a what? Right, and there's a message in that all by itself. And then it says in verse 15, and they did so and made them sit down. This goes back to our understanding that God very seldom, if ever, does anything without first using his body, right? God always works through his body to get the job done. So the disciples are a mediator between Christ and the people to set the people down. They are obeying him and the people are obeying them. So all these people are under the authority of Christ. They represent the church of the living God. They represent those who are following Christ. And therefore what that means is there are seasons in our life when God providentially and intentionally puts us in a place of hunger. Now how is he going to feed us? Through the obedience of faith. How is the obedience of faith going to work? It's going to work from the top down. Christ is going to tell the leadership to set the people down. And if you are God's sheep, you will sit down. Because you've got to sit down to feed. And sitting down means to be subject. And so as the leadership is subject to Christ, then the people are subject to the leadership and the leadership instructing them says, sit down, we will feed you. But the whole thing is an act of faith because the only way we're going to eat is if the Lord blesses the provisions. Right? Right, so everyone must cooperate with the sovereign Lord in this event if they're going to experience the blessing. They're all hungry. Now notice what the next verse says because this will get us into the use of our term. Then he took the five loaves and the two fishes and looking up to heaven, he blessed them and break them and gave them to who? So the first uh response or the first action on the part of Christ is to bless the bread in the hands of leadership. You guys got that? Because leadership now has to dispense the bread to the people. So the apostles here represent our Lord Jesus Christ on a human, tangible, practical level of feeding the people, don't they? Right. And notice this next clause in your verse, because this underscores what I mean by commending. It says in verse 16, and he gave to the disciples to do what? Set before the multitude. So in the same way the disciples took the bread that had been blessed by the Father in the prayer of the Son and given to the disciples, they set the bread before the people. Paul is setting the people before God. You see the picture? In the same way that the disciples are setting the bread before the people, Paul is setting God, the people before God. So this is what I mean by the only right thing that could be done when he says, I commend you to God. Go back to our text now. I want to show you what else this means by way of implication and application. So let me ask the question. How is Paul setting a whole church in the presence of God. How's he doing it? it how, how does he take human beings and put them in the presence of God? Anybody know? You should all know. There's only one way and there is no other way. Is there any other way? Is there any other way to take a person that lives in Uganda, or a person that lives in China, or a person that lives in Russia, or a person that lives in Africa or Europe, and place them into the presence of God except through prayer. There's no other way. And think about how powerful that is in terms of Paul's understanding of not only, watch this now, the infinite nature of God's presence everywhere, but the power of prayer to actually be able to do it. Does God see Paul's 
efforts at taking the whole church in the context of prayer and placing them before him as actually being placed before God? Yes. In the same way in which the bread was blessed and broken and every person that sat experienced the miracle of those five loaves and two fishes covering 15,000 people. Every time the apostles said it before them, a miracle took place. In that same way, prayer is miraculous when the believer understands their privilege to communicate to God about things that are outside of the scope of their ability to resolve. Are you guys hearing me? Right, so um, in a lot of ways, one of the major errors of the church today is their failure to follow the paradigm of Christ in the matters of the sufficiency of grace needed for the people of God. In a lot of ways, the failure of the Western church because of its absence of persecution and suffering on a direct, more corporate level is its failure to follow the paradigm. In other words, do the saints have needs? Do the people of God have needs? Do the people in your life have needs? Are the needs bigger than you can handle? But what do you do about it? Do you see the problem? Do you see the problem? Exactly. Right, so I commend Paul because he didn't wring his hands. This brother did something that was powerful and I'm looking forward to unpacking it because what he stated was, <laughs> As bad as the prognosis is, as bad as this battle is going to be, you actually are going to survive. And I'll tell you why. Because I have actually placed you, paratithomy, in the presence of God. Do you got that? And, and actually, it's in what we call the present indicative active verb form. The uh, uh, active verb, verb form. Paul says, I am right now praying for you and placing you in the presence of God. So in, in, all, in all reality, understand this. There's a war that you got to fight. You're not going to get out of this war. I wasn't lying. I wasn't presenting to you a false prophecy as some would. No, you're in a war. You're going to fight a war, but God's going to be with you. Now, there will be casualties, and there will be consequences, and you're going to have to do your part, and that's an aspect of theology that we have to get. God allows us to go through trouble so that we can learn something about responsibility in our walk with God. He allows us to suffer setbacks so that we can understand that he didn't call us to sit on our tails. He allows us to go through trouble so that we can discover that he has called us to communion with him. Am I making some sense? He allows us to go through trouble so that we can see our depravity and our weakness and our sinfulness and discover that our love for the people of God is not as great as we pretend it to be, especially if you see them being taken captive, even your own family members, by carnal things and worldly things and, and, and secular things, and they're just being dragged off by the adversary, and we don't even pray for them? See what I'm getting at? But here's what he does, and I love this, because I want, to, want us to work with this, and I don't know, if, did, was there a PowerPoint given to this? It should have been. Was there a PowerPoint on this? There we go. All right, there we go. This is what I want, point number two. So he does, he does what I call three presentations. The first presentation is, he says, I present you to God. Do you guys see that? I present you. So the big emphasis is on the people of God. I present you to God. And then he presents them to God according to a strategy that he understands will work and the word of his what? the word of his grace. I present you to God and the word of his grace. And I want to talk about that briefly. This is so critically important. What Paul understood was that the church at Ephesus would need the grace of God. I'm committing you to not only God, but to the word of his grace. Now I want to talk about that with you for a moment. I want you to get this. The word of God's grace is the thing that will keep the believer no matter what trouble they go through. The word of grace is the only thing that's going to get you across the Galilean Sea, across the Red Sea, across Jordan into glory, the word of his grace. 
So when Paul says, I commend you to God and I commend you to the word of his grace, there are four aspects of God's grace that I want to briefly call your attention to. The first is the grace of God's eternal counsel. Do you see it? The grace of God's eternal counsel. You see that up there, right? So in Paul's theology, along with mine, God has what he calls in his word an eternal counsel. Or what we would call an eternal decree. Another way to put it, these are all magisterium terms. Uh, another way to put it, let me take this out because this is a different counsel. Another way to put it is God's eternal purpose. God is a God of what? Purpose. So when you know that God is a God of purpose, not a God of accidents, a God of decree and not a God of whimsical reaction. Remember, we've talked about this before. God does not react. He what? God responds because God sees the end from the beginning. Nothing ever catches God by surprise. God is never, ever wringing his hands trying to solve a problem. He fixes problems before he even creates them. And so for the believer, he has to know grace by virtue of the character of God. If I had more time, I would underscore and show you that grace is actually coextensive to the nature of God. God is by nature grace, is he not? That's Exodus 33 and 34. He is a God of grace. He is a gracious God. And because he's a God of grace, that means he necessarily, not out of any merit on your part or mine, but he extends gratuity to human beings because that's who he is. He shows mercy and kindness and long suffering. He bestows goodness on people, not because of us, but because of who he is. He is a good God. And that's part of his eternal counsel. And so when Paul says, I commend you to God and to his grace, he commends us to God's eternal counsel because God's eternal counsel is consistent with his own nature. And do you know what that is? Unchangeable. God's eternal counsel is unchangeable. Not only is it gratuitous in nature, I will have a people for myself. They will be to the praise of the glory of my what? Grace. Y'all need to learn that. Heaven is going to be all about grace shouting people. Not a one will be in heaven who is not an object of grace shouting if it wasn't for the grace of God. Heaven will be filled with a grace shouting people who will be shouting grace, grace, grace. This is the only reason I'm in the presence of God. So the word of his grace equal to the gospel, right? That's the good news. And it's personified in the person of who? Right. So grace is personified in Christ. That's John chapter 1, verses 14 through 17. You know that, right? Moses brought you the law, John 1, 17. But grace and truth came by who? Jesus Christ. He is the epitome of grace. So when God gave his only begotten son, what did God give us? His what? His grace. And when he gave us his son, he gave us his son from an eternal decree because he is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Is that true? So in the giving of his son, he has given us his grace in the package of grace wrapped up in the person of the son is what we call the gospel. It's God's eternal counsel. You know what that means? <clears throat> God has purpose to have a people for himself through the uh, life of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the incarnate son of the living God. All that Christ did, he did for those who are objects of his love and grace. This is the God to whom Paul is commending the people of God. And I'm putting you in the hands of a God of all grace. He understands that if you and I are objects of his grace, you guys got that? Watch this. Then you will be immutably destined for what? Glory. 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 He understands that if you're objects of God's grace, if God has smiled upon you in Christ before the world began, glory is yours. Because the only way to get glory is through the grace of God. It can never be done by your works or your merit or your goodness or your righteousness. It can only be done because God smiled on you in Christ. I think it's Psalm 68 around verse 11 or so. He will give us both grace and glory. Well, yeah, the objects of God's mercy are always people who are headed to glory. 
It's in glory that we will be shouting grace, grace, grace. And it's rooted in his eternal counsel. And what we love about his eternal counsel is that his, his eternal counsel doesn't change. Look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11. Now we're do, using an Ephesians text. And I'm going to use three Ephesians texts as we exhort this portion of Paul's and now in order to help you comprehend why Paul says, I'm going to commend you to God and to his grace. Verse 11, notice what it says. In whom, that is Christ, also we have obtained what? Right. Did we obtain that inheritance in ourselves or did we obtain it in Christ? Christ is the heir and we are what kind of heirs? Joint heirs. We are co-heirs together with Christ. Christ is the son. The son is the heir. And if we're heirs, we're also what? Sons. And as sons of God, we are joint heirs with Christ. Right. In whom we also have obtained an inheritance being what? Predestinated. The word simply means God purposed us to be heirs with Christ. It didn't happen by accident. Do you guys see it? We were predestined according to the what? Purpose. According to the what? Purpose. Of him who worketh all things after the what? Purpose. That's the word. See it? Do you see it? So what Paul is teaching us in Ephesians 1 is what he's telling them in Acts 20. I have commended you to the God whose eternal counsel and will and purpose is that you would be an inheritor of all of the blessings of God in Christ. I'm putting you in his hand. I'm putting you in his hand. And you and I need to know everything in life is working after the counsel of his own what? Everything, right? Isaiah chapter 46, verse 10. Isaiah 46, 10. I want you to see it here. Many verses, but I just want a couple verses to help you understand. So when Paul says, I'm putting you into the hands of God, it's because I'm putting you into the hands of a God whose plan and purpose, according to grace, is to get you to glory infallibly. Because you've been called to glory. Whenever you're called to Christ through the gospel, you've been called to glory. Did you know that? You've been called to the glory of God. We're going to see that in a moment. But the issue is, we got to get there. This is the God who declares the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, the things that are not saying what? My counsel shall what? And I will do all my what? <clears throat> is that true? My counsel will stand. I will do all my pleasure. Can God fail? If he can't fail, then he can't lie. And if he can't fail a lie, then he can't change. God is immutable. He's immutable in his own nature and he's immutable in his counsel. So like if God says a thing is going to be, what? It's just going to be. And if God has purposed us for glory, then glory it is, isn't it? Yes. And if that's true, then isn't it wonderful for somebody to set you right before the God of all grace? You couldn't have a person to pray a better prayer than that for you. Lord, take this person these people and make them objects of your grace because if you do they'll get to glory because I know you can get them there do you see it Malachi chapter 3 verse 6 another verse I just want to underscore this I love Malachi because Malachi was the Old Testament book that closed out the canon in the 5th century BC where God stopped talking to Israel because Israel was just so much like you and me. I knew you thought I was going to say something else, but I'm just telling you how it is. So, you know, when a parent loves you and they didn't told you over and over and over again, the next best thing they can do is just stop talking. It'll come in a moment. <laughs> And that's what God did for 500 years. Now, you're going to learn something about silence again on Sunday. Didn't I teach you a little bit about silence last Sunday? Some people got it. Some people didn't. You better get this. Silence is necessary if we're going to be saved. Right. So what God said was, I am Yahweh. I am Jehovah. And I do not what? Now, stay right there. If God had purpose to have a people from the days of Abraham to make it all the way up to the Lord Jesus Christ. Are they going to get there? Yes. Even if these people act a dog game fool, are they going to get there? Yes. 
even if they act like God is not their father and they, they, they fall prey to rebellion and witchcraft and all sorts of evil, are they going to get there? Is God going to see to it that they get there? But you know what God has to do sometimes to get us there? Stop talking. So he says, I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, you sons of Jacob. Do you see that term, sons of Jacob? That's when God's mad at you. When he's mad at you, he calls you the sons of Jacob. When he's happy with you, he calls you the children of Israel. So, yeah, when I was growing up, I had these favorable names and, 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 and it wasn't Jesse. Just want to let you know. Whenever my parents called me Jesse, I was in trouble. I had, <laughs> I had nicknames. And I'm not going to tell you what my nicknames were because y'all going to make fun of me. So I'm not going to tell you. But I knew I was all right when they called me by my nickname. When they said, Jesse, uh-oh, I'm in trouble. Jesse, for me, is like Jacob. You got that? Because that's my formal name. And once they gave my formal name, all leveraging of the relationship is over with. That all is all over with. It's all out the way. Now this is technical stuff and the belt's coming out. Jesse, uh-oh. Because the other endearing name, I was always waiting for that name. I know I could get away with something if they just said the other names. When God says, you sons of Jacob, that's bad. I just want you to know that's bad. I, that's almost like a curse word, okay? Because the sons of Jacob were a mess. But they were God's mess. Got it? Yeah, I had a conversation with a sister last night. She was so enthralled by the message that we had in the text. Um, and it, it, it caused her to formulate a doctrine or a theology that I get. I understand it on a practical level, but I had to help her understand that's a fallacy. She was saying that Sister Sammy's life was so radically changed that she dropped everything that she was and she entered into her new paradigm as a new creature in Christ. And old things were put away so that she was no more a sinner. She says, I am no more a sinner. I'm not, I'm, I'm not a sinner saved by grace. I'm not a sinner anymore. I'm a saint. And she thought I was going to give her a high five on that. And I said, no, you're still a son of Jacob. <laughs> Got it? Still a son of Jacob. She said, no, 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 no. My life has changed. I said, yeah, but you're still a son of Jacob. Well, no, I, yeah, you're still a son of Jacob. That's why we have a high priest. That's why we have one who ever lives to make intercession for us. That's why we have a basin full of blood. That's why we have a spirit that draws us near to cleanse and wash and purge every time we act like sons of Jacob. Yeah, you're still a son of Jacob. And daughter of Jacob too, just in case you ladies wanted to jump on us brothers. I said, my dear sister, as much as we are indeed new creatures in Christ and old things are passing away, behold, all things will become new. That's a prophetic truth talking about the end game of what will happen when we finally meet Christ. We are in process now. There's still a whole bunch of old stuff hanging on. Is that true? And while I was trying to explain that to her, Jacob was popping up. She couldn't see it, but Jacob was popping up. So I said, do you remember what 1 John chapter 6, verse 9 says? She said, no. I said, if we confess our sins. She said, oh, yeah, I've already confessed. I said, no, that's in the present tense. <laughs> if we are confessing our sins, he is just and faithful to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know what that means? You have to acknowledge that you're still a sinner. Did you get that? The righteousness of God is to those who admit that they are sinners. So I said, you know what you are? You are simultaneously righteous and sinful at the same time. She didn't quite like that. So I expect to see her next week. And then I have already prayed that the Lord will help her to see that she's still a Jacobite. And by the time she shows up, she'll say, you know what, Pastor? Yeah, I still got a little work to do. We all do. 
The point in which I'm stating is designed to help you understand that your getting to glory will have nothing to do with you, but the God who does not change. Because if he changed, he would drop you and I off of the inheritance. Because some of our actions merit him erasing us. But our names were written on the inheritance before the world began, before we had a being, before we did any good or evil. So that even though we still do evil, our names cannot be erased. Furthermore, they're written in by blood, the blood of Christ. They are indelibly written in the Lamb's Book of Life, which is the ledger for all of God's people for the New Jerusalem. And no one of, that, no one of those citizens can ever be, what, disavowed, you know, disconstitutioned, removed. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. And he that cometh unto me, I will in no wise, what? cast out. This is the God to whom Paul is commending the people of God. You guys got that? So under the first rubric of grace is an eternal counsel. The second rubric of grace I want to share with you briefly, we only got about five minutes, is what I call absolute justification. Do you guys see that? In this context, that's going back, you see absolute justification? In this context, I just want you to grapple with the adjective absolute. Because there is a false justification that has been taught for years that fundamentally argues that you're justified by what Christ did, but you're also justified by, by what you do. And you'll hear more of that down the line as we uh, explain the difference between Protestant theology and Catholicism and Orthodox Christianity, which is prevailing again in our culture. But you and I are justified absolutely and totally by the finished work of Jesus Christ himself as your substitute. You guys got that? Romans chapter 4, verse 25 says this, Romans 4, 25, and then 5, 1, and then I'll show you one more verse. So I want you to believe in and mark out the adjective absolute. When it's absolute, it means it's complete and there's no room for addition. There's no room for perfection. There's no room for expansion. It's absolute. And the justification of all of God's people was completely established by the death of Christ on the cross. Romans 4, 25 says that he was delivered for our what? And the who is who? Christ, who was delivered for our offenses and he was raised for our what? He was raised for our what? In other words, when Christ rose again from the dead, the father had justified all of his people from all of the sins that they would ever commit past, present, and future. And he vouchsafed our justification because Christ rose from the dead. What's wonderful about this is, is no matter how you and I default, our understanding of God's acceptance is not rooted in our default, but the resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ. So what God basically did for me was secure my eternity in Christ when Christ rose again from the dead. And then he took Christ and put him in heaven to let me know where I'm going. Does that make sense? So I'm headed there because he's there. Now he's not there for himself because he was always there. Even when he came down here, he was still there. Because as the son of the living God, bearing equality with God, he's everywhere present. As he said in John chapter 3, right? He's in glory in a body because that body represents all the bodies of all believers everywhere who are confident that they will be in glory with him one day because where he is, we shall be. Even as he says, I'm coming back to get you. If you believe on God, believe on me. I'll be back to get you. And here's how you know, I'm there for you. That's an amazing truth, but it's essential to know. It's essential to know that you are already in heaven in your vouchsafe and in your substitute, the Lord Jesus Christ, even though you're down here. You guys got that? You're already in heaven. Right. So the only way you can benefit from that is through faith, though, because it's crazy down here. It is crazy down here. But the Hebrew writer says we have an anchor of the soul, even the Lord Jesus Christ, who has passed into the heavens for us and is at the right hand of God. That means our anchor is the reality that Christ is seated at the right hand of God. An anchor is necessary when your boat is being tossed to and fro in the midst of the seas. Isn't that right? An anchor is necessary. And the anchor for the believer is not his own strength or his own graces or his own ability, but your God and your Savior who is anchoring you in heaven so that no matter how much you've been tossed down here, God will never let you go. He'll never let you go. 
It's a beautiful truth. Absolute justification. Therefore, in verse 1 of chapter 5, it says, therefore, we have what with God? Therefore, being justified by faith, we have what? With who? Through who? So again, if we were to break verse one down, we would understand three critical parts. Therefore, is what we call a conclusive clause. Our conclusion predicated upon verse 25 is that we have been justified by faith. That is apart from works. In other words, I'm not justified by anything that I did. I'm only justified by what he did. That was affirmed by his resurrection. So justification is absolute and total only by faith. That means I have to simply believe God for what he said Christ did for me. I don't get to bring anything to the table. I don't get to add to it or take away from it. And so by faith, I know that I am completely and freely justified by his grace because Christ rose again from the dead. I have peace with my father through my Lord Jesus Christ. Notice again, Christ is always the mediator of the blessings. He always shows up as the qualifier for what God will do for you through Jesus, in Jesus, by Jesus, for Jesus. I love Jesus, don't you? So absolute justification comes because of what Christ has done for us. And you can see this again in Titus 3, 5 through 7. Don't go there. Let's just move to our next one. Not only did uh, the word of his grace through his eternal counsel merit for us by the death of Christ an absolute justification, but it also merited for us a perfect what? Right. And so, again, the, the adjective that I want you to grapple with and embrace, if you can, is the term perfect sanctification. And why do I say that? Because, again, in our churches, unfortunately, there is a kind of teaching around sanctification that requires you to do something of which if you fail to do or fail to do adequately, you will not be ultimately sanctified. And that's a dreadful doctrine as well. So what the Bible would teach you is that your sanctification is perfect and complete in Christ, just like your justification is. You guys understand that? Your sanctification is perfect and complete in Christ, just like your justification is. And uh, I think I want to show you one verse, first of all, in Hebrews. So go with me in your Bible to Hebrews, maybe Hebrews chapter 10. And uh, I'll see if I can pull this up and then I'll show you one other verse. Now, if we were taking our time working through systematic theology, I would tell you that sanctification which is a net consequence of justification. You cannot be sanctified unless, of course, first you are what? Justified. And if, in fact, you are justified, you will indeed be sanctified. Sanctification is the net consequence of our being justified. Um, so I'll read in Hebrews chapter, what did I tell you to go? chapter 10. Okay, I'll read in Hebrews chapter 10. I'll start at verse 7 and then I'll go through verse 10. Verse 10 will be the verse that we'll use to argue our point. Uh, then said I, lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me. Jesus is speaking in Psalm 40, verse 7, being echoed again here in Hebrews 10, to do thy will, O God. Above when he said, sacrifice and offerings and burnt offerings and offerings for sin, you would not, neither had pleasure therein, which were offered by the law. Then said he, lo, I come to do your will, O God. He takes away the first covenant in order that he might establish the second Verse 10, by the which will, see, remember, the will is the counsel of God. The will is the decree of God. The will constitutes God's purpose. I came not to do my own will, but the will of him that what? And Christ taught us to pray. Did he teach us to pray? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy what? On earth as it is in heaven. So every true believer has been given the spirit of adoption by which we cry what? And Abba Father is the same as Father, your will be done. You got that? This is why Christ uttered Abba Father in the Garden of Gethsemane when he struggled with obedience to take the cup. And he ultimately said what? Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And when we say that we have received the spirit of adoption, it means that we have the third person who agrees with the second person, who agrees with the first person, in order that the will of God might be done in us. We will not say yes to God's will without the spirit of God. But even with the spirit of God, we say yes. Struggling. Don't we? Don't we? We say yes, struggling. Is that true? 
I love honest people. Honest people won't go to hell. You're just re religious folk going to hell. Honest people won't go to hell. It's a struggle to obey God, isn't it? It's a struggle to obey God. But when you discover in you a desire to obey God, a willingness to obey God, a, a longing to obey God, because you know God is right, then there's good hope that you have the spirit of adoption. Does that make sense? Yeah. Right. So the Hebrew writer says, by the which will, we are what? Sanctified through the offering of the body of Christ. What? Once for all. God sanctified you. You know what that means? He set you apart. He cleansed you. And he qualified you to be part of his priesthood system. Did you get that? Yeah. God set you apart. And in your own time, you can read 1 Corinthians chapter 130. Christ has been made unto us sanctification. Righteousness, wisdom, and redemption. So the person that's justified is justified by what God did for them outside of them 2,000 years ago in the person of Christ. Then they're sanctified by, by what God is doing in them by virtue of the Holy Ghost. So sanctification is always relational. Justification is positional. Sanctification is relational. Justification, positional. Sanctification, relational. Justification, positional. For us. Sanctification, relational. In us. Got that? That's why he's called the Holy Ghost. The spirit of sanctification. The sanctifier. Right? Sanctification in us. Justification for us. Glorification to us. You got it? Right. The prepositions are important because the Holy Ghost is in us, preserving us for glorification. Remember, I told you, if he gave you grace, you're getting what? Glory. But between grace and glory is what we call sanctification. This is the hard stuff. Y'all with me? A few more minutes. So, the word of his grace that Paul is commending uh, the saints to has an eternal counsel with an absolute justification, a perfect sanctification, and a permanent what? Glorification. Crazy. Romans 8, 17 and 18. I'll just quote these right now for time's sake. I wish I had time to just go through all of the verses that underscore this truth. Listen to what it says in Romans 8, 17 and 18. I think that's what it is. Here it is. And if we are children, then we are what? heirs of God and join heirs with Christ. Didn't we learn that? Yes. If so be that we what? Stop right there. Right, so this is the thing that we have to learn. That when God saved us and placed us in Christ, he put us on a path that corresponds to the path that his son was on. This is why he says in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes unto the Father but by me. Not only is he the way literally, he is the way demonstratively. Not only is he the road, but he is the way demonstratively. He is the truth, but he is the truth demonstrably. And he is the life. He is the life demonstrably. What, in other words, what he's saying is, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. In other words, the way I'm going, you're going. So like, you don't get to go to glory a different way than Christ went to glory. Right, because sonship requires suffering. This is a necessary theology in your soteriology because this is where we get in trouble, particularly the Western church. Think, for instance, if you and I were living in um, Syria and all the hell that's breaking out and, and the Christians that have been destroyed, just decimated in Syria and Iraq. Uh, let's go to Ethiopia because it's happening there too. The oldest church there. And, and, and forget denominationalism and all that stuff right now. Just assume general, the Christian church, right? Watch this now. All they have known is suffering. So how do they embrace suffering on a Christocentric, Bible-based level and benefit from it if they don't redeem that suffering under sanctification that is designed to conform them to Christ, to draw them near to God, so that for them, glory really is the only way out. Okay. You know what suffering will do? Suffering will keep you from succumbing to a prosperity gospel. this delusional business that God sits up there as some kind of cosmic genie that's quickly ready to pour out to you all kind of physical, earthly, material blessings as if he has to do that, as if Christ died for that. 
If that were the case, there is just massive bastions of Christian who missed out on those blessings the last 2,000 years. And why should we as Western Christians have that benefit? And they didn't. That's a delusion. What God has promised us is glory. To be honest with you, he's also promised us suffering. But he also told you he'll feed you along the way. And he has been feeding us, right? I mean, it's been rough. Has it been rough? It's been rough, but he still feeds us, right? So, you know, I love God because I, I'm one of those brothers. Just I grew up in the hood and I grew up poor. And God, you know, God will teach you how he coming through at the last minute. How many of you know the God that comes through at the last minute? I mean, you know, he might do it differently with somebody else, but he hasn't done it with the pastor that way. And, and what I love about God is he works in patterns that are consistent so you can learn his ways because he loves relationship. Right. So don't rubberneck. Don't turn your head looking at nobody else because God loves you individually. And he has a particular model of relationship for you. He might come through for me on the 15th. And you on the first. So, so don't try to get your blessing on the 15th because yours is coming on the first. See, welfare folk know what I'm talking about right here. See, if you ain't a welfare person, you don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, and, and when we receive our daily bread, you know what we discover? His grace is sufficient. Right? His grace is sufficient. And so we pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day alone. Is that what we pray? Yeah. Because tomorrow is not granted. Right. Sufficient is the evil for today. Right? And so our brothers and sisters who live in that kind of daily realistic context are just thankful for today's bread. They'll talk, they'll think about tomorrow when tomorrow get here. And you and I are so encumbered by presumption because we have things so automatically given to us that we don't even thank God for today's bread because we're presuming upon tomorrow's. Isn't that true? You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to stop and pick up this next time because I really do want to work through the concept of building a strong body because that's what Paul meant when he said, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up. And I want to talk to us next week about the aim of the gospel is to build us up. That's the aim of the gospel. Let's pray. So, Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for your word. Thank you for our class. As we go our way, give us traveling mercies. You are a glorious God, altogether lovely and wonderful, and your gospel is amazing, and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys.